Welcome back to the Sip and Feast podcast, episode number 41 with Tara and Jim. I am Jim. What high-end kitchen gear is not worth it? Tara, good title. You came up with it? Did I come up with it or did we steal it from some? I think you came up with it, but you know, like most things, it's probably already been done. It's already taken. I'm sure it already is. Um, it's a It's a fairly common question, I think, that Maybe you're in your own first place uh, that you are thinking about spending some money on kitchen gear, kitchen appliances, and maybe a lot of people are steering you in the wrong direction. Yeah. So we're going to steer you straight today. That's what we're going to do. I think one thing to note is if buying high-priced items as like a status symbol or something that you can you know, tell your friends about. That's not what we're really talking about here. Um, we're talking about are these items actually worth it when it comes to cooking? Yeah, we're talking right? about, that's right. And a lot of these items that you might, you might recognize these, a lot of these are pushed all the time on Instagram, I would say. Uh, specifically, Instagram is a buying platform more so than YouTube. Uh, TikTok also, TikTok has their shop now that they're pushing so aggressively. And uh, basically, this is all about monetizing your attention. That So if creators, influencers engage in like selling a lot of stuff, like saying, hey, I use this, I approve of this, you should buy it too. Um, one, you should question whether they're telling the truth and they actually use it. But two, you should know that they're making a lot of money off of you buying that product. So we're not going to get into specific like creators or anybody who engages in this because it's so rampant. It's just crazy. We're actually, we don't do it. Uh, you know, we do have an Amazon shop of stuff that we recommend, but we're not in, we're not in the influencer game. I, I hate the word. So I, I, you know, this is really more about talking maybe about some of those products and which ones we think are good deals and which ones that we think you should definitely not consider. So yeah, right before we get into that, I want to let you know that last week was the first taste test that we did, and we are still gathering feedback from you. If you love these, and I do love doing them, I like doing them here, more so than in the kitchen, how we did the YouTube videos. Remember, mm -hmm. we did the sauce one with James yeah. and the pizza one, if mm -hmm. you've seen it. I like them here. I think it's really laid back. The stakes are low. You know, it's not not a lot of high stakes here. Uh, we're always going to put them towards the end of the podcast. We don't know if this is permanent, though, yet. It really depends on what you think. We want to make this for you. So you let us know again. You can see right here in back of me is what we are. These are the things that we are going to taste today. So they are to be told to you later, unless you can see right now, which you probably can, you know. Well, you're not going to say what they are? Okay. All right, we'll tease them up. It's not fair to let the okay. video viewers. You know what? See, we're really uh, we're really trying to find our feet here, you know. <laughs> um, okay, Tara, what are they? Quadratini. Quadratini by Loker, which is a weird name for an Italian food company. I think it might be Swiss, actually, but... Um, it's that border it's of always, uh, Italy. They're and, always, yeah. Actually, let me let me see right now. They're always sold in Italian specialty stores. Um, no, they no. It is product of Italy, and I'm yeah. showing my age because I have to hold it really far away from my face in order to read it. Um, yeah, it is a product of Italy. Yeah, I always thought actually. That. No, wait, hold on. Okay, hold on. Go. Okay, the back says South Tyrol, Italy. And then that's the northern side, Italy. Yeah. The side says product of Austria. Okay. Well, anyway, it's that it's that the Dolomites area, like that. That's the area. So but, I was wrong when I said Swiss. It's Austrian. Yeah. Anyway, these are a very popular product, and I don't want to spoil it. We're going to taste test them later, and uh, hopefully, you like it. But before we do that, let's get into the meat of this episode, Tara. Mm -hmm. So, Jim, I have here a list of some what I would consider to be high-end kitchen gear items. And I'm just gonna ask you if you think it's worth it or not. Let's go. I'm excited. 
I don't think I know all these. Okay. The first one is a cast iron pan, but not like the one that we have. It's a higher end one. I'm not going to say the brand name, but it's shaped like an octagon or hexagon or, or one of those. And it's around $400 yeah. dollars, US dollars. Worth it? Not worth it? Not worth it at all. Um, the pan the pan she's referring to is nice. They're really, they're beautiful pans, but cast iron is cast iron. That's why you probably have cast iron in your family that your grandmother used or your great grandmother or maybe your great, great, great grandmother because it lasts forever. Can you destroy it completely? Can it rust till it makes a hole through it? Yeah, that's possible. But uh, for the most part, you can get any type of old cast iron pan and you can rejuvenate it to brand new again. What are you getting for $400 in this octagon cast iron pan? Well, you're getting a pan that's not round, number one. So that is uh, that might be worth something to someone. It's very mm-hmm. unique. I think you're probably, and I don't have, I don't have one of them. You're probably getting an extremely smooth surface on the pan, which people, if you buy a lodge one, which lodge are kind of like the workhorse, like they're they're an every man cast iron. They're, they're relatively inexpensive. Those ones are a little bit rougher. So, you know, some people will go as far as, and, you know, people are nuts about their cast iron. They're, they're truly nuts. I mean, there's like communities all devoted to this, but they'll go, cra- they'll, uh, they'll sand it to like a baby's butt, you know, super smooth. And they'll season it like with like 19 coats of flax oil or whatever, or whatever they're using, vegetable oil. And they will uh, be able to cook an egg in that cast iron with it out sticking. So almost like yeah. they're getting their cast iron perfect to almost like nonstick standards or or so they say. Mm-hmm. But you can do that with any type of cast iron pan. It doesn't have to be this octagon one. This octagon one is really a status symbol. And I don't know if the company engages in using influencers to sell it or whatnot. I have a feeling they do, you know, but not, can't say for sure. All right, the next one, and I'm I'm saying this one, yet I want one of these even though I know. Well, yeah, and people might really want that octagon cast iron pan. Yeah, so this item I want, one, because it looks nice. Two, because it comes in some really pretty colors. Pretty colors, (laughs) right here. No comment. You bought me this shirt. Yeah, but I wouldn't want a cooler that looked like that. That's ridiculous. Oh, I know what you're talking about. All right, yeah, go on. Yeti. Cooler, Yeti. Okay. So they're so expensive. And last yeah. summer, before we were going uh, on our Airbnb trip, I had to get a big, a big ass cooler <laughs> because we had to keep all the food that we we were we were going to like an Airbnb in an area where there was remote area, not much food, lots of bears. So we brought no, there wasn't no. They uh, the owner told me there was no bears in that area. But anyway, we were going to an area where there's not a lot of restaurants or there was one small grocery store. So we stocked up ahead of time, bought a bunch of stuff to bring with us and make Yeah, in their kitchen there. And so I needed a large cooler to transport all of that. So I went and I priced and I really, really wanted like one of those Yeti coolers. Again, pretty color. Yeah. But wound up going with a much more economical one, which shockingly we found at... Costco. Costco, yeah. Um, I Which brand is Igloo. it? Igloo. Igloo, thank you. So Igloo is, you know, like, it's not like, it's not sexy. Yeah. Like the, the Yeti cooler is sexy. Uh, though I think the, I do like the way the Igloo one looks. Yeah, but it, I don't know. Yeah, like I, I get what you're I, saying. Honestly, like if I was like going to go to like a Jones Beach concert with my friends and like tailgate beforehand, I would want to roll up with one of those Yeti coolers. Yeah, they are. really cool. They are cool. But- is it worth it? No, no, not at all. I mean, look, I, I'm not, I didn't even know, I, I don't even want to look at this. I don't even want to know what the what the other ones are. Uh, so I don't know. So it, what are they using? Are they using thicker insulation? Possibly, okay? is Now, if they're not using thicker insulation and it's the same thickness as Igloo, then they must be having some better tech in that insulation. Like that insulation has a better R value, which is what, you know, the rating of insulation, um, then the igloo. 
I suspect the answer is no. I suspect it's all marketing and the colors are a really important part of the marketing, which is what was appealing to to you, Tara. Yes, I'm a victim. You're weak. I'm a victim of marketing. You're weak. Well, we all we all are weak. <laughs> no, okay? if, I'm not weak. If I was weak, I would have I would have bought the Yeti cooler or I would have asked for it for a gift for a you, holiday. I know you didn't. The reason that's not really the truth here. The truth that she didn't buy the Yeti cooler. Because I was she, afraid of you. Yes, that's that's probably <laughs> it. I'm, I'm not kidding. She knows that I would be like, oh, what you know, what are you doing? Yeah, and, that's a good point. Well, a, a lot of it's a principal thing. So we, we discussed this in, in last episode about the price of restaurant food and just how it's out of control. There's plenty of people that can afford to spend three, four, five hundred dollars to go out to eat all the time, but they're eventually going to say, you know, no more. Like I've had enough. So it's the same thing with this. There are plenty of people that can afford the Yeti. Uh, unfortunately, and you know, I'm not probably not telling you anything you don't know. The people that can least afford these things are probably the ones that are buying them the most, those coolers. So again, unless it's space age insulation, like it's NASA insulation and something else unique about it, it's probably the same relative insulation value as an igloo, which means that it probably, if you put a whole thing of ice in it and you put your beach food in there, you're probably going to have, I mean, God, that igloo one, I, we had ice in there for seven days. I was going to say that. How much, I was what is impressed. the Yeti going to do? What, what is the Yeti going to do? Give me, uh, keep the ice going for a month? You know? I was very <laughs> impressed with the performance yeah, it was. It had all the ice in there when we left yeah. after the end of the vacation. Yeah. Yep. So impressive. You know, I don't know how much better you're going to get than that. Then there's also like hydro flasks that used to be popular Th with that's kids. That's on my list. Oh, it's that's on your list. That's actually the next one. Okay. Hydro Maybe. flask. And hydro flask seems to have been somewhat replaced with the ginormous Stanley tumblers. Stanley got lucky. They said it was, it was like a fire and the whole car went on fire and the Stanley cup was the only thing yeah, that survived. Something like that. Yeah. So are those worth it compared to... The other types of insulated water bottles you can get for much cheaper. Stanley has always been an economic, like, you know, a value brand. Like I had the Stanley thermos mm -hmm. for for work. Yeah. When I eat my food out of it. That's right. And that would keep it warm for a very long time. I had another Stanley one. But yeah, Stanley was never considered high end, but I think a lot of that has changed now. So, I mean, it's a big windfall for the company. Again, I think it has a lot to do with the the colors. The colors, yeah. They're like these really cool looking colors. Some of them are more obscure than others. You might wind up spending like $100 for what should have been $40. But the Hydro Flasks also were, were very popular, but I don't know if they are I don't hear as much about them as I am about the Stanley Cups, but I, I did kind of bucket them together. I agree on that. I think the hydro flasks went out of style about five years ago. Mm, no? Really? No. Maybe four? I, mean, I feel like it was just like last year. Oh. I don't know. I, I go, don't know. I'm, I wearing, go, I'm wearing this color shirt. What I go do by, I know? I go by what the kids want. And I think it was in 20, 2019. God, that was four years ago. So maybe you are right. Yeah, I think it's about four or five I'm years like, ago. I'm like, I'm in a time warp. Me too. So 2019 was when Sammy was like, I need to get a hydro flask. All the yeah. girls in school have one. Exactly. So maybe you're right. Maybe it was four years. But I feel like it kind of lasted beyond 2019. Yeah, I mean, things don't go from like being super popular to nobody buying it. There's a gradual decline. Mm -hmm. And the brand tries to then re, you know, remarket, reinvent itself. Reinvent itself. Yeah. All right, so the next one on our list of what high-end kitchen gear is not worth it, a KitchenAid. I'll preface this by saying I know we've talked about KitchenAids before. We have a KitchenAid yeah. that we use frequently. Yeah. But if you're not a baker, you don't really you make bread or you're not really into it, is it worth it? It takes up a lot of space on your counter. So- what do you have to say? I don't think it's worth it. Really? I do not think it's worth it. So that might be, you know, hearsay to you, uh, heresy, heresy. Um, that might be something controversial. You do not need a KitchenAid. And I'm gonna tell you, like, unless you consider yourself a bread maker, you know, I can't imagine you're gonna be making enough desserts to justify the thing. 
unless you have a dessert food block. What would be the break point for you? A like break point, how many, how many times, times per would year? you have to use it? Because for me, I would say that it, I would say for me, it's worth it, but we use it a okay. lot. It's not about how many times per year. It's about how much you're going to make. So this is the thing. For pizza dough, and I'll and I let me tell you, I'm not te- I'm not saying anything profound here. This is what a ton of pizza people will tell you. People who are big pizza enthusiasts at home, they will often still not use the KitchenAid because it's pain in the butt to clean that bowl. Number one, by the time you get everything out, you get your KitchenAid out and everything, you could have w- mixed up your batch for two, three dough balls in a second and you hand knead it. Five, eight Mm -hmm. minutes hand kneading. And then you ball it and you're done. Uh, I'm serious. So now if you think you're going to be making a ton of pizza and say you want to make like 16 dough balls at one time, then you absolutely will want a KitchenAid because, you you know, your arms are going to fall off trying to knead that much dough. Yeah, well, if you're going to be making that much, shouldn't you have like an industrial size? Yeah, I, well, I mean, mixer? we have the, we have the biggest uh, kind of like home one, mm-hmm. even though it's called the Pro Model. It's probably a six. I think it's a six quart bowl or six point five. I think you know KitchenAid continues to try to like innovate in the home, the home part of their business line. So I think they have an eight quart now, or maybe even a ten quart bowl, but. That's tiny compared to what these commercial places use. I use, I worked in a bakery when I was young and I wasn't like, I wasn't a baker, I, but I would go back there all the time to bring back like five gallon containers of soup and stuff and go into the walk-in to take out other food that we needed. And the size of the mixers they had were the size of this table. Mm-hmm. Took two people to to lift the dough onto the counter. But that place did, they did so much bread making. So yeah, if you're, if you think you're going to be doing a ton of bread, a ton of pizza, then I would use it. But if you think you, I mean, look, every pizza recipe that I've made a video for, which is about 20 of them, every single one has been mixed by hand. Every one. And I did that purposely to show you that you can do it. But I'm telling you, just in practical sense, it's kind of a pain to whip that. Unless you have a really, you know, if you're loaded and you got, you could keep your KitchenAid on the counter at all times, then... Then, but if you know, if you got to go move that thing and it's really heavy and it's just, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to disagree with you because I, if I'm going to bake at other times during the year, I will often use a hand mixer, right? But around Christmas, when we're making a lot of cookies, I will use the KitchenAid for that. And I think. If you're only going to, if you're going to use it once a year and if it's going to be to make a large amount of cookies, I can then see it is worth it. I could see that. I mean, really the big, the big advantage of it is that it can develop the, you know, gluten faster. The, it can knead faster than anybody can unless you're the Hulk. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. But a lot of the baked stuff you're talking about isn't even really contingent on a lot of kneading. You're just using it to mix. You're using mm-hmm. the mix function of it. Exactly. Which... Yeah. I mean, you can have an electric hand mixer for that. Um, I'm trying to think of- Like I'm using, the uh, when I make cookies, I'm using the paddle attachment. When you make bread, you're using the dough hook. I'll give you an interesting example. So when in episode number 40, where we taste tested the St. Joseph's Day pastry, that's the one that I made recently and put up on the site. So that is, you're making a pat dough in the beginning and- if you look online, almost all recipes for St. Joseph's Day pastry will do it how I did it, which is making the dough by hand. In you know, you do it in a pan, you mix your flour in, you just cook it for a minute. It's really simple. But and I'm not I'm not trying to talk negatively about Sally's baking addiction because she's her site's amazing and everything, but she's got a recipe for cream puffs, which again you're using the powder shoe dough, and she's you know, showing people how to make it with a mixer. It's just, it's, it's to me, in my opinion, it's completely, it, it's not needed. It's, you're, you're going to have to dirty that thing when it's so simple just to do it in the pan, how I did it. Yeah. I mean, there are certain things like for me, I would never use a KitchenAid to make, or even a hand mixer to make 
muffins or banana bread or anything like that. That stuff is bar- supposed to be barely mixed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not using and a mixer for that stuff. And you're just using... Yeah. No, but like, so... It's very particular what you need a mixer whatever for. It's, whatever is... E- like, what I need a mixer for is when I want to cream butter and sugar. Yeah. That's when you want a mixer. Yeah. Or if you're if making you're, a cake so and now, you need it to be mixed for a certain amount of time. So admittedly, now, now we're kind of getting a little bit out of my element here because she's, Tara's talking about desserts and I don't make a lot of desserts. So that's kind of why, you know, you might be saying, Jim, you're you're really wrong about this. And there there's a good chance that I am. It's, I'm, I'm just giving you kind of kind of my, my lay of the land here. What I think, you, I, honestly, a lot of times, these aren't the same tools at all. They're very different, but- a lot of people will be faced with a decision. Should I get a KitchenAid or should I get um, a food processor? You're better off with a food processor because a food processor can make your dough. You can you can make pizza dough in it, uh, bread dough, but it can chop everything. So, and that, you know, especially if you're getting older and like you have a little arthritic hands, that, that could be much more useful. Mm-hmm. I, I feel the KitchenAid is kind of a luxury item. It's It's expensive. It takes up a lot of room, which means, again, you have to have, you got to have space to hold it. And often, you know, the people who have the most money and have the biggest kitchen are cooking the least. So it's like, it's kind of like almost like a status thing. Mm -hmm. It's not used. Yeah. I can see that. They always say, like, you go in, you know, you go in the kitchens, there's, it's spotless. They've never been used before. So, yeah. Again, I'm trying to give you my perspective on it. Every single, dough recipe that I have on the site, whether it's pizza or bread or anything, I always try to approach it from, the person who doesn't have enough money to afford any of these tools. Mm -hmm. There are a couple recipes though that I do have the KitchenAid in there. Yeah. You know, it's another one that it's really good for. If you fancy yourself someone who's going to want to make homemade pasta, that's good too, because then you get the pasta attachments and you can add them on there. But again, nobody's going to really make a lot of homemade pasta. It's not a thing that's done. And by the way, it's not a thing that's done in Italy either. It's romanticized, but uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's just not, you know, it's, it's not something it, it's, it's, it's odd that people have developed this thing, thinking that homemade pasta is better. Also, it's most of the time it's not, it's not meant for a lot of sauces. Mm-hmm. So, but again, if you want to do that and you want to make like ravioli, tortellini, uh, you get it, you put your sheet attachment on there and you can just get pasta sheets really easily. Yeah. All right. That's a lot. There was a lot, a lot mm-hmm. there. I'm sorry, but like. I did feel a little strongly about that one. Yeah, well, it's good. We agreed to, to I mean, we, to ha- we have one, okay? Yeah. And we do use it. Yeah. All right. What about, uh, you've spoken about this before. What do you think about expensive carbon steel Japanese knives? So the average rock on the Rockwell scale, Rockwell scale measures the hardness of the knife, and Japanese knives are typically a, a lot higher than Western knives. So- this says right here, the typical Japanese knife will be uh, Rockwell 60 to 62. But, you know, you'll see a lot of ones that'll be 63 or I, I think even 64. Um, that makes them very brittle, but they can get a sharper edge. Carbon steel supposedly can get a sharper edge than stainless steel. It actually, there's science behind it of basically when you sharpen it, it's, I don't know if the pieces themselves, the metal that's sharpened are smaller. It can, it, it can, I mean, Metal, metallurgists and just machinists, I hear it all the time. I don't know if they're putting science out about it or whatnot, but, but, so you get a sharper knife with one of these Japanese knives. They're thinner also. They are typically carbon steel. So carbon steel will rust. They're high, high carbon knives. It'll rust fairly quickly. Like you put water on it, you know, you leave it on your drain board, which is what most people do. Uh, it will start rusting in a couple minutes. Really? So it's just surface rust that you can wipe off again. But really what you're supposed to do is as you're using it, you are drying it the whole time after. So you cut through a vegetable, you're drying it. Okay, you do meat, you're washing it, then you're drying it. And then at the end of the day, after all that process, you oil it. Okay. You see Japanese chefs do this all the time. If you go sit at the sushi bar, look over what they're doing. And you'll see their you'll see their habits dry, you know, yeah. they're constantly, constantly going back and forth for it because that's their the tools, and they have all different types of Japanese knives that they use. So it sounds like you 
if you want to invest in these knives, you should be prepared to maintain them because they do need quite a bit of babying, it sounds yeah. like. So to answer the question, are these expensive carbon steel knives worth it? In my opinion, I think that if somebody's a real kitchen connoisseur, I'm gonna give, this is not really giving a good answer. I think you should get one. I think if you are really good with maintenance and and then you're like, oh, wow, I love this. I'm not going back. Then you keep using it. Now, I didn't even get into the sharpening aspect. It's very, very hard to sharpen an R62 knife. It's hard. Like, you, you know, you need whetstones. And if you have whetstones, you need a diamond plate because you got to flatten. As you sharpen with a whetstone, you're going to remove, you're going to make a divot in the stone. So then that stone itself needs to be sharpened with the diamond plate. You could also just sharpen them straight on a diamond plate, but it's so much easier just to sharpen a Western knife that's an R55, R54, sharpen it in, like sharpen it in a couple minutes. And um, it's, it's, it's a lot more useful for, I think, for a home person. I mean, typically I think a home person might not even get into sharpening too much, mm -hmm. but I don't know. Uh, the Japanese knives are also very brittle. If you drop a Japanese knife on the floor, it can crack in half. I've seen pictures of that. You drop um, a Henkel, you know, Wustov, they're not going to crack. They, you might break, the, you'll break the tip, you know, you could, that's fairly easy to do. All right. One more thing, you know, I I gave, I don't know if it was one, I forget which episode it was. Nobody corrected me, but I was referring to the back of the knife, the bolster. That's not it. A bolster is what joins the knife to the handle. What I meant was the heel. So what you'll have often on the one that we have, it has the heel there, like the safety guard mm -hmm. on the heel. So I was kept calling it bolster. Bolster is actually where the knife uh, you know, it goes through and then they put the handle on. Then you'll have like a full one or a half one and you'll see like rivets through the handle. That's okay. holding the metal to to it. Okay. So. I'm not up on the uh, anatomy of a knife, so yeah, I didn't catch it. Yeah, no, nobody did. But I had to correct myself anyway. It's good. You should do that more often. <laughs> All right. On to the next one. Now, I talked about the place where we went to the Airbnb, they had a super expensive, fancy yes. range stove. Yeah, Blue Star. Yeah, it had like a separate, like a drawer for heat. I don't know, a drawer was for insane. warming. It was really incredible. But I mean, how much are those things gonna that, cost that, you? That's so, like 15? That was 15, that yeah. was a six burner, right? Yeah. Um, I think, Yeah. That was yes. it was incredible. Yes. Yeah. So. If you're, I felt, I felt like, uh, oh, I was like, just like, I was like, yes, I made it. And then, then I, uh, had to go home with my igloo and <laughs> 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 no, it was, it was, it was fun cooking on that. It was. So is it worth it to invest? I think if you have the money in a stove or a range like that, you know, listen, you, you got, if you got money you spent, you got to spend your money on what gives you the most enjoyment. So, you know, if you're like- well, you could uh, say that about anything in here. You could say that I could get my Yeti cooler then. <sighs> okay, so utility speaking, it's not worth it then. It's not, because you're not gonna get a better, look, I cook everything on a $45 portable <laughs> burner, you know? And like, you know, you can't tell the, I, I can make beef bourguignon on my burner and then you can make beef bourguignon on your $19,000 stovetop. We're not going to notice any difference in it. That See, I think that's a really yeah. good point. That's a good way to measure it. That's a good benchmark. Yeah, you're not. Now, something I don't know, like what you have there, did you put uh, vent range hoods or anything in there? I actually do have that. That's okay. Uh, you lower talk down, about, it's lower on the list, okay. but let's jump to that, a vent hood. Yeah, I think vent hoods are, very much worth it and ours is horrible because it's not it's not an industrial one i think you're better off having a regular just ge stove and oven setup combination or samsung or lg whatever uh frigidaire you know something that's like a thousand to two thousand dollars and then i think you're better off spending a thousand dollars or more on your range hood because cooking onions, cooking anything, if you could pull the exhaust out, it will just- uh, That's a good point. It's, I, I think that's really worth it. I do, and we don't have that. We have one, ours is vented outside, but it's such a low, and it goes by CFM, so um, how much air the thing can move. So basically the ones that are really powerful, they can move the air of like your whole entire house in like 
a half an hour or an hour. I really wish we had one of those because the amount of food that yeah. gets cooked in this house, I feel like I'm always, I always smell like food. I know. Wherever I go. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that is one that I think you are, you, sh- you sh- probably should spend even more money on the range hood than the oven. Because again, the ovens are, as long as it's accurate, if, you, if I'm cooking at 300 degrees, it's the same thing as you cooking at 300 degrees with your $26,000 stove. You know, the stove oven, went from oven. fifteen thousand to nineteen thousand. I'm going to be at ninety eight six thousand. I'm going to be at ninety eight thousand dollars in ten minutes. Oh, jeez. Yeah. When I discuss this about my mother's habit, it's probably the habit of so many other people. She put a microwave over her uh, oven when, you know, in our, the house I grew up in, and the person who did, you know, it was like inexpensive kitchen and everything. It has like those microwaves have a built in. Uh, exhaust, but those exhausts aren't vented. So they just like, they're just recirculating your onions back into your house again. Like they go through the bottom of the microwave and it goes out the top. So that's fine. You know, like, it, you know, the price, budget, everything was really tight when I was young. Um, you know, my parents didn't have a lot of money. I mean, I, I'm just being honest here. Like, like they were just, you know, I, I've spoken about this in the past. Um, they have more money now. And she redid a kitchen and I kept telling her, I was like, mom, Put a range hood there, but because she really had to have the microwave above her, she committed the same, you know, sin, made the same issue again, and she could have rectified it at that point. What they typically do now with kitchens that aren't the largest, but they're doing a new design, they put the microwave low. Yeah. Put them like in the island. Because a microwave, you know, this is, again, this is an age thing because people under 40 years old, like, don't use a microwave and people over 70 use it like 10 times a day. So it's like, <laughs> my parents are, love the microwave, but um, I, I guess a microwave is used less by uh, Gen Z or millennial That people. makes sense. But yeah, if you have the opportunity and you're redoing your kitchen, get the range hood, forget about the microwave, you know? Yeah, I would agree. Right? Yeah. I mean, if I could get rid of the food smell on all my clothes all the time. And the microwave is just, sometimes it's like, you know, you think it's easier. We were like reheating reheating soup up the other night for like 27 minutes because each person had to have a bowl of soup and, you know, the microwave only heats the top and then it's, then you have to like mix it. And, I don't like the mic. I, yeah. I, it's like a necessary evil, but I don't like it. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I'd rather heat up the soup in a pot on the stove. Let's move on. Expensive charcoal grills. Are expensive charcoal grills worth it? No. 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 No, they're not. They're not. I mean, they're really not. It's charcoal, okay? You could take charcoal and put it on a wire. You could just have the the, the wire insert of your Weber. You don't even need the grill part, and you can put coals, light them, put them on sand and, 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 and make a gr- and grill. No, I mean, in... There are certain advantages to like a Komodo style grill, which is charcoal based. Um, they have, they're very, they're thickly insulated again, just kind of like a Yeti cooler, you know? And what they'll do is they can keep your coal hot for a longer period of time because the problem with charcoal is always like you, you know, you light it up and then you're Weber, the web standard Weber grill, which is what we have is very thin steel and it will, it can't retain the heat. So it's like you get like your 30 minutes with your coal, 35 minutes, and then it's like you're not going to be able to sear a steak after a certain point. And then you're then you're tasked with, oh, I got to relight coal again. Those other ones, the Komodo style ones, you can, uh, you know, get a lot more uh, time in it. But I don't know if it's worth, you know, they're like $1,000 plus. I mean, the big ones, like the big green egg can go up to like over 2000 They have mm. like five different sizes. Um. So just, I think it depends what, what your budget is, you know? Yeah. What do you think? I let you do the grilling. I did just have an idea though. What? And it has nothing to do with the grill. It has to do with the chimney starter oh, and it's totally yeah. off topic. So if you don't want to, if we don't want to include this, yeah. this is just my mental note. You should do a little how to video on how to use a chimney starter. Oh yeah. I mean. And that's another thing. You can actually cook on top, like put something on top of the chimney starter and just use that. Um, yeah, I should. You're right. I should. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. We don't have to include that. Oh, well, you can, you can include it or whatever. Um, do you want to move on? Yeah, move All on. All right. I have a next on the list. 
mortar and pestle because yeah. you can get them for very cheap, but I think according to some purists, Italians yeah. specifically, you need a very specific type of marble, mortar. Right? It smooth, needs to be marble. Not smooth, uh, rough marble. Yeah. yeah, and these are, I was looking, they're like $400, $500 More, yeah, yeah. for a mortar and pestle to make pesto yep. or to make other things that you want to pound. Yeah. Um, what do you think? I would say no. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, again, if money's no object and you want to have a really nice one, it's like kind of like a chessboard. You, know, you can get little cheap pieces or you can get marble marble pieces of everything. But So do you think the pesto that you make in a food processor is going to taste as good as pesto made in a super expensive proper mortar and pestle? Yeah, I do. And I know that's controversial and there's like, sites that will say will show you though because there's like three ways to make it you can do a food processor you can do a super sharp knife a japanese knife and you can do uh, a mortar and pestle and they say that the mortar and pestle gives a different texture mm -hmm. versus the knives but i think the oldest way in italy is with the knife you know the super sharp not sharp knife but you got to be careful if your knife isn't sharp enough you will bruise the leaves and they'll turn black I don't know if that's true. Okay. I, we can fact check this, yeah. but I am going based on what I know of from the word pesto, which is derived from the Italian verb pestare, which I believe means pound, to right? pound. Yeah. And it's the same root for yeah. the word pestle. Yeah, So that's I would true. think that pesto, when it was first made, was made by pounding it. Yeah, no, you're probably right. I mean, I read that in I read that in an article that was showing the difference of the types. We need a food historian, like on staff. Yeah. Well, guess what? Maybe we maybe we'll be hiring a food historian soon. Send your resume. <laughs> no, I mean, look, look. It, it does it make a difference. I mean, you got five hundred dollars there. I would I would save for your range hood with that money. Yeah. That's what I would do. Good point. The next one, I already know your answer to this. Oh, okay. But I have to ask this question for our for our listeners. Jim, is a fancy pizza stone mm. worth it? So fancy, Tara knows my answer. Yeah, a, the fancy pizza stone is not worth it. You're better off having a steel, uh, a pizza steel. You can buy ones that are already seasoned and ready to go, or you can watch the video that I showed you how to season it. And those pizza steels that I these these are going on years now. I have two of them. They are perfect, perfect. You know, they get a little cheese when you uh, you know, when your calzone opens up or whatnot, but or you know, or your pizza overflows. But you just scrape it off. It's it's so simple. And you know, God forbid if you have to re-season it again, it's, it's it's not that hard to do. Stones, pizza stones can break, and there are dozens of. Not dozens. There are thousands of complaints online about people doing exactly that, breaking their stone, whether it's breaking it when they dropped it before getting it to the oven or the change in temperature. I think if you blast the heat too high, it can break it. Maybe if you have a gas oven, the gas from the bottom. I don't know because I don't have one. I have a, I have a steel and a steel can get hotter than a steel can get hotter than your oven. OK, so your oven itself if it's 550 and you heat up that steel for an hour, that steel can get to 650. How is that possible? How can you get something hotter than the temperature of the oven, Tara? I don't know. Maybe we need to call up Mr. Wizard and ask yeah, him. Yeah, I don't even understand it either. Like it's some like something about thermodynamics. But yeah, no, you take you take a heat gun, put it on there, and that surface temp is like 620, 630. It's uh it's impressive. And that will make your pizza done, perfectly done in six minutes, six or seven minutes. Mm -hmm. And you don't need a fancy oven to make that in either. Because nope. when you, well, we still have that oven. When you first made it, when you first filmed that video, I think the title of the video was how to make New York pizza in a crappy home oven. I did. That's how I titled it. I think I changed it since then. I'm not sure. Still have the same oven though. It's you actually know? not a bad oven. I like that. I know it's a crappy oven. Okay, let me tell you something. But it actually does a good job. Let me tell you something. That yeah. oven is better than the other, the newer yeah. oven we have. The newer oven is a Frigidaire. It stinks, okay? Yeah. It's just this nice way of saying that it's 
garbage. That's because in the filming kitchen. It's it that oven is so annoying. It makes the fan comes on nonstop when I'm trying to film. So often, you know, you might even see in videos, you're like, you'll see me walking food in from the other from the wrong direction. Like when I do a braise or whatnot. Like I've, people have commented, they're like, they're like, they're like, what? You're where? where, where what are you, your your oven's in the in the living room, you know? But that other oven that's next to me, it's too loud. And another thing is, it takes twenty minutes for that thing to get up to four hundred degrees, versus the GE one takes like five minutes. Yeah, and all I do like, why well, I think the oven is good, the stove top is not good, and that's because it's electric. That's, that's both it. both of them are electric, that's all I have and to they're say about and they're, that. they're not good. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. I want to stay in the same topic because we're talking about pizza, outdoor pizza ovens. Okay, so outdoor pizza ovens. We have uh, pavers in our backyard. We had a company do it. The guy, uh, as I asked him, I was like, well, what do you think about these outdoor pizza ovens? He's like, they're really expensive and nobody uses them. He goes, I put them in for people and then they're, you know, they, they use it like once in like two years. I think I would use it if I had it, but they're awfully expensive. Now, those are like the built-in ones. If we're talking about the portable ones, even the portable ones from Italy can be five, six, ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Then there are the ch- much less expensive, very portable ones from like Uni and Rockabox, and I think Cuisinart makes one now. And basically, all the appliance manufacturers are getting into them, and those are hooked up primarily to a propane tank, and those can get pizza. You know, you could up to eight or 900 degrees, which will allow you to do the wood-fired uh, type of pizza, though you're doing it with gas. And uh, honestly, I think if you really, if you have any interest in going for the permanent setup or one of those really expensive Italian ones, I would go with an uni first. You might be like, I don't like this. I don't ever want to do it. You're only out $500 and you could probably sell it for and make recoup the majority of your money on Facebook Marketplace because everybody likes going standing in a parking lot waiting for someone to uh, buy an uni pizzeria from you, right? On from Facebook Marketplace, you know. I've actually never sold anything through the Facebook. I used to sell through Craigslist, and I never met anybody anybody who gave me a problem. But I, honestly, it's such a. It's like. I, I only I feel like it's only worth in, engaging in those transactions if it's enough money. Mm-hmm. You know, anybody who's like, you yeah. know, if you try to sell something for like fifteen dollars and they they're like, yeah, I'm in, I'm an hour and a half away. I'll be there soon. Like, yeah. this guy's driving an hour and a half to buy a fifteen dollar yeah. item. Like, mm-hmm. he's spending more money on gas. Like, it's yeah. like you just know something's off. Something's not right. Yeah, but, but I he, think the uni you probably could sell that way. Well, you could just probably sell it to your neighbor if you don't like it. Yeah, or give it to your neighbor. This is the last one I have on the list. Vitamix blenders. Oh, Vitamix blenders. Um, So we don't have one. So I really can't tell you from personal experience. Everything I've read about them, people t- say that they're completely worth it. But again, I think it comes down to, are you going to use it? I've heard from people who have it and they love it and they do say it's worth it. Yeah. But they, it seems like those people use it multiple times a week. I think if you're just like want a Vitamix blender to make margaritas once in a while, I would say no. But if you're going to make like a smoothie every single day, do it. Yeah, I remember when I used to go to uh, the gym, they had a bunch of those and they would make the best shakes from them. Yeah, I remember that. It was a, a peanut butter peel. Oh, I love that. That thing was so that was from, good. That was from ba- Bally's. Remember Bally's? I think I don't think that gym's around anymore. Now they, they were bought by Crunch Fitness. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but they made the best. Ba- the banana peel so one and then the strawberry one was good too. Yeah. It's so funny. You would get this shake. You, the guy would put in like like 3,000 calories of strawberry preserves in there and like a banana and some protein powder. Yeah. And you you know you drink one of those. You're like, yeah, I'm doing great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe that's why I wasn't losing any weight when I was yeah. in the gym. They, they were so getting good a though. peanut butter peel <laughs> all the time. All right. So we talked about whether or not these things are worth it. What are what if people do want to get them? Do you have any solution like solutions, I guess, or tips for maybe saving money on buying some of these more expensive items? Yeah, I think you definitely I, I would avoid the really expensive ovens and stovetops unless like, you know, if you have a really expensive kitchen, 
if you have like a hundred thousand dollar kitchen, it looks weird if you put in like a, a GE Spectra. I'm sorry, like like it does. It's that that's that's kind of the thing where they get you. Like you have the super high end kitchen, you can't really put one of those in there. But I, I mean, you could. So. I would really just again. I would get the range hood, and which which we don't have, and I desperately in need of one of those. So you can't find a range hood or like some of these more expensive items at like a Home Goods or Home Sense or Marshalls, like any yeah. of those stores. But what I will say is those stores, if you want like a more expensive pan, like maybe you want a Queez, uh all clad, all clad. It's all clad. That's more yep. like more high end. If you want something like that, go look and see if you can find something at at Home Goods or Home yeah. Sense. And then if you did want a KitchenAid or if you did want a Vitamix, a lot of times, especially when it gets close to Christmas, Costco will have like one hundred and fifty dollars off one of those items. Yeah, they will. Um, Costco doesn't normally have Vitamixes, right? Mm. It's always like. No, they do. Oh, they do. Okay. They do. They have that. They have the Ninja. The Ninja is the one that we have. I'm not a huge fan of the Ninja, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Um, I used to like it more. I, I just, I don't know. I don't like the blade either. The blade. It's hard to clean. Yeah. I've cut myself on it. Yeah. Like I just, that's my own fault, but I'm just not a fan. Yeah. That is a hard blade to clean. I don't use a blender that much, Um, but yeah, I do love the idea of home goods. Home goods is, I've. We got a really nice all clad, um, kind of like roasting pan that mm -hmm. that you'll you'll see in some of the videos. Really, really nice. Uh, that would have been expensive from all reg all clads regular, like online or Macy's or wherever it's sold. Um, I've gotten other good stuff there too. They have occasionally Home Goods will have Le Creuset, but they're not that marked down i find right yeah. they, those are still relatively high mm -hmm. home goods actually has all clad has like a cheaper line that is just for home goods the hard anodized pans we have okay. one that pan works great i i really do like it even though i guess it's technically non-stick uh we we find a lot of stuff in there though sometimes you'll you'll just you just gotta like you gotta get lucky that's true it is a lot about luck like yeah. when i found that all clad roasting pan that was like my lucky day. Yeah. It was not the norm. Yeah, that one's good. The one I saw recently, I was going to buy it, but but I didn't. It was a kind of a a shallow Le Creuset pan uh, that was enameled. That was probably a four quart, maybe a 3.5. And that would be nice for like doing like chicken and rice or something. Mm -hmm. So maybe next time. Okay. Well, Jim, anything else you want to... Any other items you want to talk about whether it's worth it or not? No. That I, was my list. I, I think we're good. I really want to get to this taste it. test. I figured you did. I can hear your stomach growling. Yes. Okay, so let's bring him in. All right. Yes, I am excited. I am. Now, give a little, well, let's give a little backstory on these, right? Like, I mean, just talk, do you want to talk about what so, we're having? Yeah. The flavors? Yeah. Okay, so- this is not the first time I've had Quadratini or this brand of Quadratini to be specific. I used to buy the dark chocolate flavor all the time. When I worked in the World Financial Center, which is now Brookfield Place, the store, I, I call it the school store, but it's the, the store that was in the building. They used to sell that size bag and I would buy them and my friend Anthony and I, we would we would share them and I would eat them all the time. I love them. So I am biased. I've already tried these. I know that they're really good. Yeah. So Tara's right. I mean, I, I didn't know that there were a lot of other brands of these. These are the, this is the brand L O A C K E R Loker that I always think of when I think of Quadratini. There are so many flavors. Today we have dark chocolate, we have vanilla, we have hey, hazelnut. Mm -hmm. And lemon. I mean, I feel like I've had a lot of other flavors too, right? Strawberry, yes. raspberry. So I got the ones that they had at Uncle Giuseppe's. I have had like a raspberry and cream one. I've had strawberry. In fact, they have a matcha flavor, but I can never find yeah. them in the store. Um, 
they have a tiramisu flavor, they have a coffee flavor, they have yeah. many, but I figured these were a good yeah. starting point. And again, it was really what was available to me at the store right. yesterday. Well, let's let's go for it. I mean, I want to describe these to, yeah. to, to our listeners, you know, not, you know, the people who are watching the YouTube, they can see them, but to the listeners, these are a wafer. So um, right now I have the chocolate one in my hand and it's like probably about five, right? You'd say about five people, pieces of the wafer, right? It looks Stacked like on top of each other. Yes. And then four layers of the cream. Yeah. So it's in a cro between. cross hashed wafer that then has chocolate in between. The whole entire thing is this it's a square that's about an inch by one inch by probably three quarter inch high, maybe five eighths of an inch high. Mm -hmm. So be 26 millimeters by 26 millimeters by about 18 millimeters it's a, high. It's a bite size. Yeah, very much a bite you size. You would not bite this in half. You yeah. would just pop it in. All right, so I'm gonna do the chocolate first. All right, that's what I'm gonna do too. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Gotta clean your palate. I know. This is my favorite, my favorite flavor. Oh, it is? Yeah, because I've had them all. Through the years, I've had them all. And the dark chocolate is one I keep going back to. I'll do the next one, vanilla. Mmm. Mmm. Wow. All right, well I- That's good too. I think that's, I think that's better than the chocolate. If you've never had these before and you're wondering like what, what they are, they are just so good that you you these can be dangerous. Like you, you just, mm -hmm. I've had so many times, and Tara's been buying these since probably before Sammy was born, you know, and she's 15. And I would always just, they would be in the closet, like the closet, and I just couldn't stop. I would just like start, <laughs> I was just like shoving them all in my mouth before she got downstairs. All right, let's try the next one. All right, the next one's hazelnut. Hazelnut. Mmm. Mmm. That's really good. That's really good. Yep, that might be. I'm a big fan of the Nutella Be Ready bars. Yeah, they taste Those very similar. Those are so good. This, of course, it's the hazelnut. Um, That's making me think of that, but I think it's even better than the Be Ready bars. I'm not as big of a fan of the Be Ready bars as you are, but we will... We'll, if you want us to do that one, we'll do a taste test with that one too, and maybe something else. We couldn't taste test a few Nutella products because I they have the sticks, they have the biscuits, and they have the Be Ready bars, and I have my favorite of those. And I'll, uh, but I'll save that for another day. We should do. We yeah, maybe we should do all those yeah. the Nutella right, products. You in might want to like like t do a palate cleanser because this is lemon. I did. I okay, did. I gotta cleanse. I gotta yeah. cleanse my palate. Okay. Hmm. I feel like like Jordan Peele and when he did the Continental. Oh god, I love that. And he's like, mm. now let me let me tell you that lemon's real good. This is so hard because they're all excellent. I'm gonna just gonna I'm gonna rank mine from what from best to worst. Mm -hmm. This is this is gonna go against what you're saying. I'm gonna go with lemon as my number one. I think that's Sammy's number one. Yeah, I'm gonna go with. Hazelnut as my number two. And then the chocolate and vanilla are the same. That being said, they are all excellent. Mm -hmm. what, what say you? Well, my number one is the dark chocolate. That's the one we tasted. They do have a regular chocolate one, which we didn't try. We can try it in another one. So dark chocolate's number one for me. Number two and number three, I think are tied. And that's the lemon and the hazelnut. Okay. And the vanilla is my least favorite. I the, thought the vanilla was really good the too. The vanilla, um, they're all, I'm not going to kick yeah. any of them out. The vanilla was really good. It was just out of these four, it was the lowest on my list. So let me ask you a question. These remind me of, do you remember these, remember the long mm -hmm. stick wafers? Now those are yeah. an, those were like a mm -hmm. American United States product, right? Mm -hmm. what, what are those that I'm thinking of? They, I, I can't remember what they were called, but they were just wafers. I, rem, I remember. Okay. And they were like bright, like pink. Yeah. 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 Yeah, those were good. Yeah, so these are like a much smaller bite mm -hmm. and more dense bite than those were. Those were a lot lighter. These yeah. are denser. Yeah. 
Well, there you have it. They're that's delicious. today's. That's Check today's test taste test. We'll link the one, all the ones that we uh, tried. We did we did a taste test last week as well. This these destroy that other the other one that we had. What was the other thing we had? It was um supposed to be like a cornetto, like yeah. a chocolate filled croissant. That was a big letdown. This, this is a big. I mean, these are solid. I knew these were going to be good, though. You know, yeah. what would you give? You got to give a rating. Like, I, I'm not going to yeah. assign a rating to these. I mean, they're all they're all, they're all a ten. They're all they're, they're all, all they're all amazing. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're great. Let's go to the questions. All right, Jim. This question comes from George. So I have a question for you guys. Some of the best prep or make ahead dinners for those busy weeknights doesn't have to be Italian. Make ahead, George, would be any soup. I mean. Soups are better the next day. So that's something that you just have to just plan it in advance. Dishes that can truly be made in 30 minutes, it's always tough. We did a whole episode on that about 30 minute, like real, the reality of 30 minute meals. And you really have to have a little bit of prep already that already took place. I know you want more, right? I'm grabbing... Another dark chocolate <laughs> quadratini. But George, I mean, one of the best ones is just, and you can do this quick, you really can, is a 15-minute quick marinara. So that one, just get your water boiling, get the pasta in, then, you know, do do a quick slice of the garlic, mince, whatever, get it in the pan with olive oil, nice can of plum tomatoes or crushed tomatoes. Pasta goes in, finish with basil. That is a really quick dinner, and it's delicious. Um... Tara, do you have any to add, add to this that can really be quick? I, I like the soup idea the most. I mean, he didn't say quick. Okay. He said some of the best prep or make-ahead dinners for busy weeknights. I guess busy, busy weeknights, weeknights implies, implies to me. quick. Yeah. I mean, I know we talk about them all the time, but frittata. Yeah. Like, I know it's a breakfasty thing, but you're putting a whole bunch of, like, dinner-type stuff in it. Yeah. And that's one of my favorite things to make. It's easy Especially if you're using potatoes that you already have left over yeah. from like another dinner that you had, it's it's pretty much ready yeah. to go. You just have to like throw the eggs and the and saute an onion and add the potatoes. And yeah, I mean George, you know what it is like, and I I've I've said this a, a lot. It's just most recipes that tell you that they're thirty minutes, they're doing that because they think that, and not they don't just think they know that a lot of people won't won't do a recipe or attempt to make a recipe that says it's 55 minutes. We really try to be accurate with our timings and there just aren't too many recipes on our website that has, you know, over 400 of them. There's just not too many of them that are truly 30 minute meals. Mm -hmm. When I often I'll stretch it when I say 30, it's maybe it's a 35, maybe it's a 40. So, but, but I don't know if that's what, you know, you said busy weeknights. You didn't say the time. Well, best prep or make ahead dinners. So like you said, soups, chilies those are all good to make ahead of time and they taste better the next they day they taste better Far the next better. day they actually should be consumed yeah. the next day instead of eating it the same day i actually think one of the, like a really really good solution for having something in your fridge to to eat on a busy weeknight is to just if you're going to make something on the weekend that's a little bit more elaborate like a sunday sauce type yep. of meal just make enough so that you can plan to have leftovers and then Use the leftovers yeah. for during the week. Make a big pot. And that's, you know? that's typical. A lot of people do exactly that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Just back to that, as yeah. far as like prepping goes, if you, you can always use chicken cutlets in some way, shape or form. So let's say it's like a Saturday and you're like, you know what? I'm just going to make like eight pounds of chicken cutlets yeah. and I'm going to use them during the week. Then you can eat them. Sandwiches. With yeah. You can eat them on a sandwich. You can chop them up and put them in like a Caesar salad. Yep. You can make chicken parm with them one night yep. during the week. Like there's so much you can do with yeah. chicken cutlets. So I feel like that's a really good that's, that prep is, that's a great, type of thing to That's do. a great idea. Same with grilled, like if you don't want to make cutlets, like breading and frying, shallow frying them, you can do grilled chicken cutlets and do the same same thing. Yeah. That, I mean, they're not going to be as good with like a chicken. Like I wouldn't make use a grilled chicken cutlet for chicken parm, but like it's good with like broccoli rob or 
you know, cherry peppers and mozzarella and yeah, you, you that's I think Tara got the best the be, she has the best one uh, chicken cutlets definitely. Next question, Jim. This comes from Elizabeth and family. We got a full eight inch wheel of Swiss cheese as a Christmas gift. Do you have a good recipe to highlight the cheese and may help us use a good portion of it before it goes bad? How big did wheel did they get? She said eight inch. Oh, eight inch. That doesn't sound too big. What type of cheese? Swiss. Oh, Swiss. Eight inch Swiss. Yes. Oh, okay. So she said, uh, the, the, the second part of that says, I know it must have cost him a great deal. So she's hoping to invite him over for dinner and share in a dinner that focused on his gift. So she's really looking for something that will highlight Swiss. the Swiss. Chicken cordon bleu. Um, you can use Swiss for French onion. You can use Swiss for even uh, the Italian dish called chicken valdostana. That's usually fontina. Fontina. Used, right? Yeah, fontina. Swiss can be substituted for fontina. Yeah. Those are all good. I uh, I mean, God, we spoke about like things that were not popular anymore, but Swiss is good for fondue. That's right. You know? It is. Yeah. I think those are all kind That's of like good the main, ideas. Isn't that the main cheese that's used for fondue is Swiss? Yeah. What about um, a mac and cheese? Yeah, mac and cheese. Good. That's a good one too. But you wouldn't. You wouldn't just be Swiss. You'd add other cheeses in there. Yeah, I mean, I know the type of block thing you're talking about. It's probably similar size. You know, like how you get a big chunk of the Yalsberg in yeah. Costco. So it's probably came from like a a wheel like that because they cut you like the big chunk. She, mm -hmm. she probably has eight of those. You know, because it's eight. She probably has like an eight pound or a ten pound. But it could be a lot larger than yeah. that. I'm not sure. I don't the exact know. Size. I mean, she's saying it cost. It must have cost him a great deal. You can wrap really tightly, and in plastic, and it will last for a very long time in your fridge. It, you know, I know I'm not technically supposed to say this, but if you get a little surface mold on it, you can take it off, and it'll still be all right. The other thing right? I I would say, if you want to serve this ahead of the meal that you're going to make. Do a charcuterie board and, yeah. and eat the cheese just yeah. in its own state. Like maybe pair it with, I don't know, some, what does Swiss cheese go really well with? Like be, would, beer? Would beer be a good compliment Yeah, I mean, Swiss? it goes good with mushrooms, you know, like how they do like a Swiss and mushroom burger. Yeah. You know, Ooh, but I think Swiss free, I think Swiss can freeze pretty, pretty well. So you can also just divvy it up and then freeze it. I think that would be good. So that's final question. Thank you, Elizabeth and family. And leave your comments, questions to podcast at sipandfeast.com. You can also send me them in Instagram through a DM or through a video DM if you like. Let us know what you think of these taste tests. Okay, this is the second one. If you like them, if you love them, we're gonna do them. We're gonna do more of them because I like them. I do. You get a little snack too when we're... Uh, you know, it's rough. It's rough out here. Yeah, you know? it is. I, it's rough for me. I have to listen to your stomach growling the whole hour that we're here recording. Yeah, it stopped it. If you have suggestions of things you want us to try and taste test. Yeah, these are two sweet ones, know. two sweet ones we've done, but yeah. it can be spicy. Like we could do peppers. We can do, we could do, yeah. we could do crackers. I mean, we're going to try, we'll do anything. we have a few Italian sodas that we're going to try sound good. next time. So that's not going to help you with your like desire for snacking, but it should be, it should still be fun. But yeah, I mean, we're open to trying anything really. Yeah. The olive, extra virgin olive oil taste test. Probably by the time you hear this, it will probably be up on Patreon. If you're not subscribed to the Patreon, you should consider subscribing. You get about one or two extra podcasts per month, and I also throw on some cooking videos. So that olive oil taste test was filmed how long ago, Tower? Like last summer. Last summer, and we never got to putting it on Actually, YouTube. We weren't sure about it. It was before, the, the kids were still in school. Yeah, it was a long so time ago. it was ago. before the summer. So it's on Patreon now, and I'm happy to put it out there. So if you're not subscribed there, take a look. We do appreciate all of the support. We'll see you next time.